Born in London in 86, a stash show gent named Richard Parliament. He loves to wrestle, but he loves one more thing, and bells round the world. He fights in his comments and he argues with fans. It's a problem no one understands. If there's two things he loves, it's getting at, and bells round the world. Drinking fine wine, fighting fanboys, handhelds round the world. Top Hat Gaming Man. Hello ladies and gentlemen, Top Pack Gaming Man here to bring you more content. On this channel in recent years, I have covered a number of handheld platforms while simultaneously traveling around planet Earth. Further to this, I have also made videos on here on various different games consoles that have seen cancellations, from the Panasonic M2 to the Atari Panther. We have talked about all sorts. Today's video is going to marry these two concepts up into one cohesive video when we look at a cancelled handheld gaming device. Today's video is literally transitional content in somewhat of a paradigm shift for this channel because as of next week I am going to be releasing all new episodes of handhelds around the world every week for the duration of the summer. We have a lot of handhelds to get through ladies and gentlemen, so before I get around to reviewing more ridiculous handhelds I own, this week we shall look at a system that was never meant to be. If you have clicked this due to the thumbnail, you will realise that the handheld in question is not simply any old handheld but in fact a platform that was set for release by Nintendo, the granddaddy of all handheld gaming manufacturers. So ladies and gentlemen, what makes Project Atlantis so special? And more importantly, what prevented it from ever seeing the light of day? Let's explore both of these questions in this video. Yeah. Prior to the release of the Game Boy Advance, Nintendo had created designs for a completely different handheld console, which had been codenamed for Project Atlantis. However, this creation would never reach the consumer market. It was alleged to have began development in 1995, and rumours about it surfaced around 1996, after the media reported Nintendo's next handheld was scheduled for release in winter of that year. The media outlets would include Electronics Gaming Monthly and Game Informer. Here is some interesting information surrounding this mysterious device, which like the World Cup, was never going to come home. And much like its namesake, the Atlantis, it was doomed to sink to the bottom of the sea. Some people speculated that Project Atlantis was actually the code name for the Game Boy Advance. This isn't actually true though, because the code name for that advanced version of the Game Boy was creatively named um, the Advanced Game Boy Project. Yeah. Further evidence that backs up that this was a completely different project to the Game Boy Advance was the time frame in which this system was in development for. The development of the Game Boy Advance did not even start until after the release of the Game Boy Color. The GBA's development cycle also lasted less than two years, as the GBC featured an extremely short life cycle. Project Atlantis looked to be far more ambitious than the GBA, and a much longer time frame was used in an attempt to successfully develop this platform. Project Atlantis was allegedly going to be a 32-bit system, which was to feature four buttons and a larger screen than the original Game Boy and would have been powerful enough to play 3D polygon games on. In fact, it's rumoured the screen on the GBA is actually smaller than what was proposed for the Atlantis. It was also apparently going to be somewhat like a portable version of the Nintendo 64, and would have utilised a 160MHz processor. This means it would have actually been more powerful than the GBA ever was many years later. In addition to this, despite this power level, it was intended to feature an outrageous 30 hour battery life. Bloody God knows how they intended to do that. I don't know about you, but this is now starting to sound too good to be true. 
Perhaps these big promises are why this never made it to the market. Especially when you consider today that the Nintendo Switch can only get a couple of hours battery when playing high-end games on that platform. In late 1996, Nintendo confirmed the existence of the Atlantis. However, they also advised it wasn't going to make a 1996 release on the basis the Game Boy Pocket was selling well enough that they didn't need to rush their next product onto the market. They advised it would see a release in 1997, though looking back at history, we know that was never meant to be either. Ultimately, Nintendo ended up cancelling this project altogether. This was supposedly because the system ended up being too large for Nintendo to feel happy calling it a handheld console, and also because it used too much power. Again, extremely ironic when you look at Nintendo's current gen handheld platform. It is amusing how perceptions change over time, eh? On top of all of this, the system was far too expensive to manufacture in the first place, and to put the icing and cherry on the cake, apparently Nintendo were not happy with its technical performance either. With all of this information in mind, perhaps this means that somewhere in this world, there's a prototype laying around somewhere which, if we are lucky, will someday rear its ugly head. Similarly to that of the Sega Polluter in recent years, which I've also covered in depth on this channel. Regarding the size of this apparent monstrous beast, the lead developer for the Nintendo DSi, Masato Kurahara, decided to do a little showcase of the Atlantis, a project in which he himself had been involved with. In a GDC 2009 lecture, he showed the Atlantis next to a DSi, and it was considerably larger. In fact, by looking at the picture, I would believe it must have been at least three times bigger than the DSi. I mean, for the mid-90s, with all that tech in there, what else could you expect? It must have weighed a ton too. The system design itself, although obviously only a prototype, is black, ugly, and boring looking. So I suppose Sega Bloody Nomad eat your heart out. Now going back to Electronic Gaming Monthly, which had been one of the magazines which had reported on the Atlantis, they also had advised about a possible new Mario game, which was going to come out on the platform. This launch title was going to be called Mario Castle, and was, as usual, going to be a first party development title. Apart from that, nothing else is known and it can be assumed the game was cancelled alongside the actual Atlantis. But in this modern world of the information superhighway, who knows what will surface with regards to this in the future. Overall, it is a shame that there is not a vast array of information out there on this one. Despite all of this though, it is still fun to ponder. What could have been if this system had actually seen a release? As stated though, in terms of future info, all hope is not lost yet, as more light seems to come to these things as time progresses, from my experience. Lastly, I suppose it is fairly interesting to note that Nintendo did finally aspire to their dreams of releasing an ultra powerful handheld gaming device. However, it is also amusing to note that the Nintendo Switch suffers from many of the problems that reportedly would have held Project Atlantis back so much. Just like the Atlantis, the Nintendo Switch is powerful, oversized, features a terrible battery life, and the system is also by far the most expensive handheld ever released by the company. So, with all this in mind, you could even argue that the Nintendo Switch is Project Atlantis, but hey, that's just a theory, a game theory. Thanks for watching, yeah. So ladies and gentlemen, what do you think of the information regarding Project Atlantis? Have you ever stumbled across anything offline that I have failed to cover? Maybe you have read something in a magazine back in the day. Let us know in the comment section down below. If you liked today's content, do not forget to like, comment and subscribe for in-depth content just like this on this channel every single week. And if you want everything sent straight to your phone, don't forget to hit the notification bell too to stay notified on every video. As mentioned previously, over the next five weeks on this channel, I am going to be relaxing for the summer over in Greece. And when I say relaxing, 
what I actually mean is reviewing outrageously obscure handheld gaming consoles for the general public's amusement. But you've got to make a living somehow, eh ladies and gentlemen? Over the years, all of your support has been genuinely extremely humbling, and it pleases me to no end that all of you appear to enjoy my work so much. So finally, my channel, Top Hat Gaming Man, is partly funded from the fantastic support and donations I receive from my lovely Patreon benefactors. So, shout outs to Carl Johnson, Shizuka Kobayashi, Michael Keneally, Greg Hooper, Harold Webb, Since Spaces, Kevin Fahili, David Mountford, Andrew Vazansky, Edward O'Reilly, Peter Zadorn, Retail Archaeology, Tom Elliott, Mark S. Hines, Gary Pinkett, and all of my other patrons. You people motivate me to no end. When it comes to pumping in hundreds of hours of work every month to bring these ridiculous videos to life. So, as always, from the bottom of my heart, thank you so much. Cheerio!